speaker, Dr. Kitty Hung, is here. But my role in this, as I give you a bit of preamble, my name is Darwin. I'm the chairman of three great groups, BCS North London, Central London, and South London branches. And a few of my colleagues are here as well. You've seen um, Anna outside when you registered, and Diana is around somewhere, don't know where. Um, also, David, who is a key man in the back, he is producing the video and also the streaming to our online movies. So they will be able to benefit from this. And later, you will tell us if they're asking any questions. So if you're online, please do enter questions into the chat and um, we'll pick them up, David in particular, and feed them to our speaker, Kitty. Okay, well, we do a number of things to do with business analysis. In fact, we have a business analysis initiative. We have a number of initiatives. You really do have initiatives. We have a number of initiatives, and this is one of them. This is the business analysis initiative, and Kitty is the lead for this. What you're seeing is some examples of past events that we've done already. And they also have the URLs, the video links. So you can cut and paste, copy and paste, and watch those videos yourself. And I very much recommend that because you see the ongoing story of some aspects of business analysis. And they're all produced by, they're all presented by Kitty who is very much an expert in business analysis. So I think I'm going to hand over to you yeah, at yeah. this point, yeah? But one thing I should say is if you hear any bells, tap on your head, make sure it's not coming from there. Tap on the head of the person next, next to you, it's not coming from there. If it's a real fire alarm, you're not expecting it, run. You'll see them disappear in a certain direction. Just try and keep up with you. <laughs> but on a more serious note, the fire exits are out the way you came. And there's also another one, a secret one, which is to the left into the big room, back of the big room, fire exit out into the street. I suggest remember to take your coat with you. Yeah. All right. So that's it, really. And May I hand over to Dr. Kitty Hung? And thank you, Darren, for the nice introduction and good evening, everyone. And really appreciate you come all the way here. Um, it's Christmas, it's a quiet month. You, you have a lot of Christmas shopping to do. So your time spent here, I hope it will be well spent. I hope you can get some takeaway uh, back to your workplace. So today, I'm going to talk about um, Beyond disruption, how generative AI empowers um consultancy sector. I've been in the consulting sector six, seven years. Uh, I am the lead for the business analysis initiative in BCS because I've been a business analyst for 27 years. <laughs> so this is my agenda, introduction, a little bit about myself. And I, I've been doing uh, research since November 2022. As you know, the generative AI and large language model only came out officially to the consumer market in November 2022. No one except Sam Altman can claim they are expert. And I am not an expert. I have 13 months experience in trying the uh, generative AI and large language model. When it came out, I was thinking it's a groundbreaking technology. It will go a long way. And 13 months down the road, I can confirm that I'm right. I look at um, this presentation is a collection of my research because I don't claim I am a, uh, an expert. So I've done the research about the impacts of AI in IT consultancy sector, the research on the uh, big four, and I look at the changing landscape of the uh, client services from the traditional IT consultancy services to the AI-powered, AI-driven consultancy services, which the gen I believe the consultancy market can generate a higher value of the income. 
and the shift in consultancy paradigms and the adaptation to the AI change, the disruption. And I think we should be more positive to embrace the AI, to use it as a tool for the future success. And I have some case studies, so I would like to share with you. And also, finally, the consideration and guidance when uh, using the generative AI. So a little bit about myself. Um, my background is um, computer science and technology. So I, I gained my PhD in computer science in 1999, 24 years ago. Um, my discipline was uh, software modeling. So when I uh, finished my PhD, I stayed in the university for a couple of years as a postdoctoral research fellow. I was doing the research, con it's like an extension of my PhD. But then two years later, I, I changed uh, the job. I moved to the industry. I became a business analyst for in the telecom industry. And after two years, I um and I and also when I was working as a research fellow, I was working in Sheffield University as well as a London Business School. London Business School is not a business school; it's a business enterprise. They 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 do all sorts of high tech research, and I was the research fellow in the at that time. It's a mobile technology, uh, sponsored by Luton, and then. After my spell in uh, sales structures, I joined the central government in the Metropolitan Police, um, and I stayed there for 15 years as a senior project manager, senior business analyst. And then I moved back to the industry. And that's the, that's the year I started my, con uh, I joined the dark side, become a consultant in the consultancy sector. So I joined Capita, um, and it's also a turning point of my career. Because it was the first time I actually, as a business analyst, support uh, Internet of Things. So uh, I was put in the uh, smart meter program. <clears throat> so I was dealing with um, um, emerging technology like the Internet of Things, the IoT. The smart meter is a computer, but it doesn't look like a computer. All you can see is a box with a little number in the middle for the meter reading. But in fact, it does many things. It's a computer. A transmit of your reading, all the activities uh, in your household between your uh, smart meter and the utility suppliers. So it's very intriguing, very exciting. After more than two years, I moved to Raytheon, which is the defense contracting company. And I continue um, my support to um, on military technology. So in Raytheon, I was supporting the um, uh, digital twin and digital flat. Um, I learned a lot. And after about 19 months, I moved to Atkins in 2021. And I work in the ADSNT, Aerospace, Defense, Security, and Technology, and as, as a principal consultant uh, in business analysis. So that's me. You might say, well, from my CV, I didn't put anything about AI, uh, why am I here to talk about AI? Yes, I am not a ML, machine learning engineer. I'm not an AI data scientist. I'm a researcher in generative AI, which is I'm really good at as a researcher. So I would like to share with you my research journey. So I found that you, um, with the generative AI and large language model, I'm sure you all agree it's a groundbreaking technology. If we are, as a consultant, see, we provide consultancy service. We sell ideas to help customers improve their performance, productivity, uh, improve efficiency, improve competitiveness. That's all we do. So it is our job to con conceptualize our idea to lead the customer to their journey to achieve their goal. With the generative AI and large language model, it's like so big. It's like a big elephant in the room. We can't ignore them. So my decision is to look at how we can leverage the technology to help customers even further. And that's mm -hmm. where I started my research journey. So I look at if we traditionally, our clients use us consultants to give them idea and also to solve their staff shortage. So 
We will perform uh, project work like business analysis, testing, solution architecture, um, development. All these uh, project work, program management and PMO, uh, program um, uh, management office, and what else? Scrum master. And agile, like product owner. So that's all we do. When you look at um, for the automation, the clients may use um, the AI like co-pilot to um, automate the Excel sheet. I used to know uh, a consultant. He, is, he was very, very good in Excel, a fun skill, and he could command a lot of money because of his um, skill. He's very good in all this visual basic script, all this Excel formula, and that is a very valuable skill for him to command a very high uh, daily rate. However, now we don't need that because we have co-pilot. We can actually make the conversation with the Excel co-pilot and say to the co-pilot, generate me a new graphic, or do this formula, do this. I do not need any visual basic skill or any quick skill. As a business analyst, it hits home really hard because the generative AI, and understand natural language and then translate the natural language requirements all the way to computer code. So it cuts out all the middle bit. As a BA, I'm the one who kind of bridging the gap between the users and the community and the development community. And all of a sudden, no user stories, no acceptance criteria, no BPMN notation, no use case diagram, no UML notation. So I'm sitting here say, okay, what should I do? So that's the way, that's the trend of uh, the whole consultancy market. Testing. The gender AI can automate the test script and to do conduct the testing. So testing manager become a challenge. Solution architecture. If the AI can generate, keep generating the code, then the developers will take the code to test with the user communities. If they don't like it, if they want to change the requirements, they will just regenerate, keep generating. So is it really financially viable to just to keep generating uh, um, architecture specification, solution design, architecture document, thinking that in a couple of minutes, you will have a software to test. So. The AI is really a disruption to all the traditional IT work provided by consultancy sector. And in a, from the outset, it sounds like a threat. So how do I, how do we turn a negativity and threats to a positivity and to upskill ourselves? Okay, so that's my next slide deck. That's the like, the, I explain co-pilot, for AI too, we do not need any advanced level Excel skills. You can ask the co-pilot to do for us. And then the AI chat box can automate the um, solution. If you go to some website, you don't have to click navigate different pages. Mm -hmm. You just tell the chat box what you want to do and the chat box will just come back with their answer. And that's the, the future. It's just in, um, in the sidebar of the screen. So I think that it results in some kind of uh, financial pressure in the traditional um, IT consultancy market. So we shift to, we have to face the reality. I think there will be increasing needs, increasing needs for traditional IT work, but increasing needs for more generative, strategic, more, um, if you like, using your emotion and um um, intelligence and to uh, lean towards the soft skill side. And the next one is the AI enabling business processes, changing the demand from uh, consultants. I, I already went through that um, the automation. You can see call center, the tier one, they don't use a uh, human to take uh, the call or request. They just use AI chatbot. It only maybe when it escalated to level two, level three, then they may have a human like decision look to kick in. So a lot of business processes have already been um, generated by AI. So how do we um, kind of 
tackle these challenges and to come out uh, the other side brighter and stronger. So I think you know, the three key points is um, there is a necessity for consultancy firm to adapt the, and stay relevant and competitive. Because if you kind of see your colleagues or other company on the sideline that, oh, they're all in AI, I'm not doing them in as short as six to 12 months time, you become irrelevant. That's, that's the uh, harsh reality. We need to consider that. And also the key point number two is emphasis on creative solution and um, using our unique human skills. We, I mean, we, 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 we can do a lot of things that AI cannot do yet. Um, yet. <laughs> and the third uh, point is uh, develop the new AI enhanced offering and uh, embrace the AI as a tool. So the future, what's the future look like in my, in my world? It's AI tool to improve operation efficiency and also it's a kind of uh, a, a charging model need to be changed. And then the opportunities for skill enhancement and uh, modernize, modernizing the talents and, um, and building. So in, in consultancy market, people is very important. People with the skills very important. So the structure of consultancy market is the training is an integral part of the career training. So we need to modernize the training. So if someone still send the BA for the UML notation, BPML notation, that is a bit irrelevant now. In my opinion, I think in consultancy market, the training we need now is prompt engineering. You have you have master prompt engineering. You can just do the use the AI to to leverage your career. The third. Point is um, refocusing high value services and become an AI literate and AI forward in your career. So that's the evidence. But then there's some research about um, McKinsey. They have the article about the potential of AI. Um, this article, you can um, read that, uh, click the link underneath for the full articles by uh, kind of extracted the key points, what they try to say. is um, When these articles were published, it was about um, October time. And actually it's only 11 months after the deep GPT and large language model came out to the consumer market. They already, when they did the survey, they already, one third of the survey organizations said they are using the AI tools. And also the, the high performance, they, there's a very interesting uh, quote from someone in the consultancy market is, um, the AI may not be very helpful to high performers, but extremely helpful to a lower performers. Because if, for example, if I'm a high performers, I'm already clever, but if I am not really good, I can actually use AI as a tool to catch up with my higher performers uh, counterparts. That will actually give people a kind of um, a consideration that, wow, it means that if I use a tool, I can catch up with someone who has uh, a lot more experience than me as a shortcut. Um, I have a good friend working in a very large consultancy company. I do not want to remain the company. Um, she said to me, they are junior consultants development program. They are shrinking from two years to, to six months. Two years to six months. They graduated the junior consultancy development program trainee in six months because they use AI. They bring them up to speed uh, to reduce the duration from two years to six months. And they are trialing now. So I need to catch up with her in the new year to see uh, whether, whether it works or not. So the next case study is from Venture Beat article. They actually reported every in America, every single dollar a company invests, the return of investment is three and a half dollars. So it's 3.5 times the return of investment. 62% of the companies are already using Genesis AI with 24% plan to invest in AI. Another article 
is another survey that the next way of disruption in the financial service um, is the generative AI in financial uh, in large language model. Financial sector, they uh, really embrace um, generative AI and large language model because the capability of large language model to go to for all the unstructured data. Financial market, they master the data warehouse, data mining very successfully in the last, I don't know, 25 years, 30 years in only structured data. They will build data farm, data warehouse, whatever, do, but only manage to um, master the structured data. And structured data has always been a challenge in industry. What they do is uh, they use last language model to monitor to uh, get unstructured data, for example, online news and social media posts to add to their capability. So <coughs> when I talk about consultancy, I will um, include the top four, okay. four consultancy companies as our template, our blueprint. So I look at McKinsey, they already team up um, Salesforce to deliver the uh, AI powered uh, solution. So it means that these consultancy companies, they have already built their internal capability, it works, and then they offer this publicly to their clients. So that's McKinsey's doing. Next one, Deloitte also. Deloitte launched Genesis AI practice to help clients harness the power of disruptive new AI technology. They all do it. They all aim. EY, who is a company, they established, they developed the EY.AI portal. It's a unified portal to offer the AI service to financial sector. So part of the research, I actually attended an AI talk at the EY office in London um, less than two weeks ago. So the gentleman with the microphone, his name is um, uh, Harvey Lewis. He's the partner of EY, and he's leading the Genif AI, large language model, and potentially AGI division. So they sponsored the event, and the lady next to Harvey, She's from Microsoft. She's talking about uh, co-pilot as well, and the moderator and uh, another panelist. So my key takeaways from the talk uh, in EY office is um, we all agree that the Genesis AI and large language model are groundbreaking and a transform transformative technology um, in the industry. And the A E I A EY AI platform offers various AI services, including an AI power auto accountancy to enable yeah, more cost-effective professional service complementing human expertise. When Harvey said this, the whole room burst into laughter. And she would say, oh, you use AI accountant. What happens to your human accountants? Are they all going to lose their job? And Harvey said, no, on the contrary. Because um, the AI automated a lot of accountancy work. Uh, uh, as Harvey said, the AI does all the dirty work, the basic work. So it means that they can offer faster, better and cheaper services to their clients. So that they may be able to attract clients from their competitors. So they actually get more business in their accountancy side. And then in terms of the human accountants, they free up the time and then they can develop their skills to help clients tackle more even problem, complexity issues in accounting. Accounting is complicated, like taxation, insurance, and all this trading and profit and loss account. So as Harvey said, their human accountants are upskilling. So that, that's the situation in EY. And then the lady uh, from Microsoft, uh, she, uh, share with uh, us the, about uh, the updates of Copilot. And then she said Copilot, um, they, when they launched the beta Copilot, they also, at the same time, they also did the research uh, and the survey. 
in America, they um, collected the uh, user feedback and user efficiency. In the first three weeks, and the productivity has gone to like 15%, just three weeks, 15%. So for example, you, you need two hours to do your job and now you need one hour, 40 minutes. So you, and then gradually, it reduced a bit more. So they said after the four month trial, the, the results from the survey shows that the employees managed to save up to 40%, 40% efficiency. It's a lot. It nearly cut the time in half. So th th that's how they, they manage their uh, performance in the co-pilot. In the UK, it is launched now. It depends, it's up to companies whether they want to subscribe the co-pilot account. It's additional price up, uh, over and above the Microsoft Office uh, 365. So the rapid pace of generative AI development has raised, also we talk about question about the potential and also harm. The harm is about the hallucination and not and training. So if someone just believe everything the AI said is wrong because the AI is not always right. It gives you some very convincing lie that, that we talk about, we discuss about. So how do we tackle that? We hopefully the model we train become more accurate, more mature, but the, at the at the moment, there this is a challenge organization need to um, focus on. AI can do good things and can do harm things, harmful things as well. And then the concern about AI transparency, the controllability and emergence of AGI. So you might ask, what's the difference between AI and AGI? So in my really humble opinion, the, the AGI is something like the extension of uh, AI hallucination. Hallucination is AI think about something without taking your instruction. And that's why some, on occasions, the hallucination means uh, AI lies to you. And But for the extension of hallucination, AI can think about something that by passing the interaction or instruction from human and then keep this data inside the AI, it will develop at time become a digital brain in the IT system. So imagine if you have a brain in your IT systems, number one, you don't know what it's thinking of. Number two, you have no control of what it's going to think. And that is Elon Musk is so worried about. It's the controllability and the predictability. At the moment when, I mean, even for chat GPT or a large mm -hmm. language model, you go to computer, you still need to form conversation uh, to your AI assistants or the last language model. It still takes your instruction and uh, generate a picture or uh, write your poem or plan your um, Christmas dinner. So that kind of like, it has an interaction between the AI and the human. From the AGI, it does what it likes. It triggers some button or um, it, it, it was like thinking, what is right to do? So that that is that is a very big challenge. And Harvey said he doesn't have an answer. So we we have to think. We have to wait until uh how the development of AGI. There is a UK AI safety summit about last month, uh in Battery Park and uh chaired by our Prime Minister. They're talking about um how to regulate govern put regulation and rules on to control AI and how to actually pause the uh, development of AGI because it's, it sounds quite powerful because if you have a digital brain in your computer system, then um, it, it, is, uh, it is very challenging. Um, critics is, uh, critical issues such as uh, cybersecurity, um, we touch on about a lot about cybersecurity. The problem is that there's, in now the AI not only can generate very convincing text for the spam mail and phishing, it can actually generate synthetic voice and also deep face video. So if someone show up on Teams talking to you, it's, you can't tell whether it's a human or um, um, AI generated image because the technology, they're pretty close to like 
the human is the other <laughs> things like human right uh, human look like so that these are the challenges uh, of uh, from the from the talk on that night so go move on to another uh, top four con uh, big four consultancy PwC they actually invested one billion dollars in the investment to invest to expand their scalability capability of in AI KPMG also very all in to AI. They even put this picture, a human sitting next to a robot in the website. On the website. So, so they kind of they give people the message that they're really serious in the development of the generative AI. Accenture go beyond extra miles. They committed to invest three billion dollars in AI, three times more than PwC. And to kind of offer these uh, services as they're offering to their clients. So you can see the big four there, me and Pas McKinsey, they're really into the, the AI. So I'm thinking the big four, they all, all along, we use the big four as our blueprint, our template. So um, I work in, I don't work in big four. I work in like more like second year consultancy outfit. So we kind of look up to the big four to see, kind of follow their, their direction where to go. At the moment, from my research, they are really big into AI. They're investing heavily. Um, Capgemini, uh, they actually offer, uh, the, they, they offer the service to Heathrow Airport using Genesis AI and large language model to improve passenger experience. So even the smaller consultancy, not just big four, they are investing heavily and they take, they're taking AI very seriously. So supposedly, okay, we make a decision, we need to uh, use AI in our consultancy market, what do we need to do and what do we need to know? So there's a few guidance about uh, using AI. First of all, understand the AI, ensure the team and yourself to have a good understanding of how a generative AI work in its capability and also the limitations. Train the users how to use the gen AI and large language model. Additional training to the user include the AI literacy, from engineering skills that I already uh, covered a bit earlier, and AI ethics. It's quite important, uh, and also the cybersecurity and overall some like general AI practices. Uh, in terms of AI ethics, it's um use high quality and diverse training data, which is free from bias and sensitive information. Um, no matter how good the algorithm is, if you have bad data quality, bad data, you will have bad output. It's like garbage in, garbage out. A lot of people think, oh, I have this large language model pre-trained, very good algorithm, but then they don't put focus on the data quality and data accuracy. So then they come back with the result, which is they, uh, it's not what they want. So data quality is the key to, um, to make the AI work. <laughs> and then also human oversight and decision loop. We will not lose our job. That's my assurance to, to you all. We will not, because we will play the role as the quality assurance quality check, whatever output generated from AI, we don't just use it, copy and paste to our client's report and all this. We need to use the human loops to make the decision. If the AI generated the output, say do ABC, are you going to do ABC? No, you look at, okay, do I believe it? Is it sensible? I make my own human decision loop, not the AI. AI is just the um, recommendation. It's up to us whether we use it or not. Do fact check your data, uh, looking for misinformation, and also avoid plagiarism. Plagiarism is a very 
a very, very um, sensitive topic. It's a lot of argument because now with the Dow E3, we can generate the AI uh, images. You don't need to go to Getty Image to buy images now. You don't even need to take a camera to go to the street to take pictures because you can just tell AI and generate that. What the AI does is um, it just crawl over the internet, all the picture and learn. This is a bridge, this is a building, this is a man, this is a woman, this is a child. And then you just collect all this information and then pro, pro, uh, present to you a picture, what you want. How can the creator, the original creator can claim copyright? It's really difficult because uh, as you know, um, in music industry, um, you, you, if you take if you take less than five seconds of a tune, you don't get sued. But you take more than five six seconds of the tune, you get sued by the creator. That's why Asheron he's been sued for like many times, three six times. That's why because the original creator said you have used six min six seconds of my tune. That's why I sue. Uh, I can sue you. And then it's a lot of uh, uh Dave Taylor shift. She's been sued a few times. But for the AI, it's very difficult because um, when they when you make the song, create the song, it, it a couple of seconds here, a couple of seconds there, and then create the song. So the a music creator they they find it will be very difficult to sue the AI for copyright or it's the same as uh, photographs and images, music. It's like um, when I was young, I learned music um. And I learned music, I learned instruments, I learned piano, I learned guitar. And then I grew up and then I play piano, I play guitar. Will my music teacher be able to sue me? That's the AI. AI is a child. Learn. Learn music, learn images. So plagiarism, plagiarism is really challenging area. I want to do more research on um, AI, um, how to, well, how to protect the... Um, intellectual property owner because as you as you know recently uh, there's a big hollywood script writer uh, strike in hollywood because ai for the whole internet and started writing scripts it's got uh, unlimited data from the internet and it just creates some really interesting stuff for movie scripts and this is like a big threat to human uh, scriptwriter and playwright. So that is a threat. So, so I, I would like to do more research, maybe the next uh, uh, seminar next time. <clears throat> so consideration, AI security. Um, when, when I said about training, the prompt engineering skill is really key to upskill ourselves uh, to use AI in the in our job, because with the prompt engineering skill, there is a um, technique called scenario-based um, prompt engineering. For example, you a police force want to uh, install CCTV camera in shopping mall um, to monitor the shoplifters, but the police force doesn't want to reveal too much in on the on 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 the GPT, uh, the last language model. The scenario base is uh, you, you can change your scenario, you can change your stakeholder, you can change your business, your organization. So you get what you want, but um, it's slightly different. The AI doesn't know your real business situation on scenario. Um, for example, you want to deploy a ro robot in the battlefield, but under the military intelligence, military security, you are not allowed, you are not supposed to tell the open AI about this. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is, uh, there's a technique that uh, you can use a different scenario to get the answer. So you can say, oh, I want to uh, deploy a robotic capability in the warehouse. So the robots can run, can jump, can walk. So that is the technique. So that will kind of, um, make the cybersecurity a bit more resilient. 
So the one is another one is that AI can improve efficiency in a good way, but bad actors and act hackers can use AI to automate their criminal activities. I'm I always like to use a a knife as a scenario and analogy for AI. As a good person, I use a knife to cut fruit, vegetable, meat. And I find the knife is really useful so I can cook my dinner. The same knife can be used by another person to harm another humans, the criminals. So how do we, are we going to control the possession of knife? Yes. You know, when you go to the street, you carry a knife, you stop by police, stop and search. If you carry a knife, you get arrested, yeah? However, there's still a lot of crimes in the in London, in this big city. So it means that the regulation, the control is not very effective. In the AI world, <coughs> it's very challenging to because the criminals, they will use all the AI algorithm, the machine learning, the deep learning, you know, network, all this te technology to hack people, to um to steal data and to harm other, uh, to attack other computer networks. So this is really a, a, a challenge. Data privacy, um, a lot of uh, people, they still think uh, only there's only one version of ChatGPT, but it's not. The open version of ChatGPT, the 3.5, the 4.0, it's a playground. It's a playground for people to, uh, to ask question about um, your personal activities, like um, planning a Christmas party, going to a cruise ship uh, trip, and going to a road trip, booking hotel, and that kind of things. That, that's fine for the open, open source of the GPT. There's another version that is called API plugin. The organization can um, buy the API plugin to either Google or OpenAI to Take the last language model and GPT, the pre-trained one, and plug into the internal data within the firewall. So the conversation between the users and the AI assistants, the GPT uh, prompt, will be encrypted within the organization and then encrypted to go to the uh, cloud, either Azure Cloud or uh, AWS. So that is called uh, GPT for business. So there are two versions. So consultancy market like the big four, what they're doing is they help organizations use the AI, they help train the AI, they help configure the platform, uh, install the capability in the organization like a chatbot or um, a co-pilot. So the, what they do is that they, it, when the organization, they have HR data, they have um, procurement financial record, they have um, intranet, they have SharePoint, they have email, and they have Outlook, they have meeting, they have Teams uh, meeting transcripts. So all these internal data, and also with the training, they, uh, they when they train the data set to the last language model internally, they also look at the user access and permission. So when you use SharePoint, you have um, the like a um, level of permission. Not everybody can go to a certain folder. It has to be approved by the site owner. Um, so that is a very, very valuable skill to be able to offer the service to the clients to train the last, uh, to use the last language model, the train model to plug in the uh, internal data set with the level of permission, security, data privacy, and also analyzing the data quality. That is what the big four are doing now. That's the, that's what they're doing now. And then they use um, AI, AI ethics, bias and fairness. And um, have you tried the GPT? I, I tried the GPT the other day. If you put um, to Dao E, um, could you generate the picture of a business analyst? <laughs> Most of the time, it will generate a man with a uh, suit. And because the, the AI, um, the machine learning engineer, the, the generative AI creator behind the algorithm, 
they because in their mindset a business analyst is a man is a white man um with in a suit so as a as a woman from hong kong a chinese I have no chance to be shown as a business analyst. So that is that's a small example of AI bias. So how do we tackle this uh, bias issue? So we need to be more ED and I inclusive and um diverse about the behind the algorithm. So we need to basically educate the the AI algorithms creator to be more the mindset to be less biased because a lot of bias are unconscious they think yeah this is the this is it um so we the, hopefully the industry will improve this situation uh in the future transparency ai transparency um yeah because um as you know the the name open ai was uh the company was set, set up in 2015, the aim was uh, to have an organization with the open source. In 2019, because of the financial constraint, uh, Sam Altman struck a deal with Microsoft and to turn the company into a closed source company. So the name of the company called OpenAI, but the, the algorithm behind the chat GPT and last language model is closed source. So that is not transparent because it's a commercial reason. They need to generate um, uh, investment from a commercial organization. Yeah, I mentioned about the data quality. So look for misinformation and hallucination. It's, it's quite common AI making things up. And the AI accountability, I talked about the plagiarism uh, earlier, it's about... <laughs> It's quite challenging to to uh, trace back the um, accountability and the source of the content and the decision is generated by AI. I give you a I give you a, a small example. Um, Twitter is now called X. Yeah, they are online trolls. Online, um, like I um, it's like a, a misinformation, a fake news, or something like um criticism, attack other people, all the all this. In the past, we can be able to look at the IP address of the source and the account and to find out who actually did that and take this person to uh, law enforcement or justice. But now it's really difficult because there are several layers. The AI could just keep generating. So you have this uh, misinformation or uh, um, bureaucratry comments against uh, disabled people or women or uh, any religious belief, you check the source of the creator and then you look at this like layers and layers of AI generated. So you and filter and filter out. So you can't really check down who's behind it because when the first creator created the AI algorithm, the AI algorithm generate a comments and generate other AI algorithm to generate another AI algorithm. And then AI algorithm generate that um, misinformation and fake new content. Then when you trace back, you have the like four or five layers. And this happens really common. So if the law enforcement or governments, they're trying really like scratching their head, how to track down the original uh, information, the original data source, because even you generated by AI. AI consent and copyright, I covered that before. It's really difficult, really challenging. Um, if you see the diagram I put down, I put all I put is just the, the source, the um the hyperlink that I give credits to OpenAI because I use DAO E3 to generate the image. So for the um graphic designer, photographer, artist, painter. You can see if you turn around that their paintings drawn by real human, it's all gone. Because all I all I can uh, all I need to do is just to put a credit to my my source to generate this image. So that 
that is that is that still very um unresolved issues about the uh, AI uh, copyrights and um and uh, uh, intellectual properties. I don't have an answer. I'm here to share my research with you guys. So don't don't think I'm the expert. So this is that's all my presentation, and I'm open for questions. Uh, I hope you find this uh, talk interesting. Um, I, I try to be positive, but I also raise some uh, awareness about you can't just go to do AI uh, with your eye closed. You have to look for many, many issues, like the challenges, the cybersecurity, data quality, the copyright issue, the plagiarism, the transparency, the AGI controllability, and the and, and also the misinformation, the fake news. So there's a lot of things to learn. But once you learn it, you just go the flow and you will, you know, you you will you will excel your career in the in, in your sector if you are in the consultancy market. Consultancy market will need to embrace AI in order to stay relevant. Thank you very much. question online yes okay any question on the floor or share comments yes thank you because you said so many of the things that i think about it but just two observations mm -hmm. the first is that all new products go through this wonderful phase of everyone wants it they normally crash at some point uh, and i think of the chat box that i have to interact with with banking all the time whose sole purpose seems to actually be to fob me off, not actually getting through to the person who knows the answer. Mm -hmm. But when you were talking about provability, as I would call it, your background in Raytheon, perhaps we don't really want to make sure without provability that we fire a rocket without knowing it's going to hit the right target. So really it's a compliment to you, but how do we get past the uh, hyping <coughs> so that this service is actually used rather than falls into disuse by doing the wrong solutions and AI generating AI, if you so correctly said. Yeah, good question. Because um, I think uh, in time, um, we'll be able to get the machine learning, the general AI more, more uh, accurate yeah. thing. And also, you look at the history. 23 years ago, 2000, when um, Google launched a um, uh, search engine, it used a page ranking. Um, when it first launched, it's still very primitive. And just time and over the years, it gets uh, more and more mature. So I think um, that's why uh, we don't go, we just use the AI um, blindly. So my previous employer, Raytheon, you know, defense sector, we need to make it right because otherwise there will be a uh, what do you call it? devastating consequence. Yeah. And that's why half of my presentation is all about human, about uh, security, quality, what to do, train yourself, become IT literate, uh, not just... Believe everything the ChatGPT is telling you. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. And how many of you are? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question in terms of the, the standards um, and the consistency in terms of the approach, particularly in terms of the way that it's going to be applied. So, yeah, you can you can use ChatGPT. You can use large language models. You can use all the algorithms for, through machine learning and stuff like that. Um, I think the way that the outcomes are generated, you know, you're going to have a wide disparity in your attempt to um, apply them, especially to the same scenarios for different people um, or even different organizations. So, in attempting to, to 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 kind of come to some sort of consensus, what do you think is 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 the best approach to try and get that standardization so that when we do adopt even you know different versions of um, AI, 
that we can come to some sort of similar outcome. I think it's a human decision loop. Yeah, human decision loop. So, um, Accenture, I went to a, uh, I, I attended a, a webinar organized by Accenture. They did an experiment um, to use uh, generative AI to generate user stories based on requirements. And um, they look at it, yeah, it's very quick, just within a couple of minutes, all the user stories generated. So then they use a human BA to check, <coughs> to check the relevance against the, because the requirements were, uh, were captured by a human uh, with the subject matter experts. So the requirements in plain English, and then just the AI would just uh, convert into as a someone I want to so that I can. And then the human looks, they just check the, they check the relevance. They, they are actually quite good. Um, but as you as you said, the, the inconsistency or the whether there's any misinformation, um, or data quality, we we do need the human looks to to uh, to validate that. So my message to you is that don't trust, don't don't believe everything from AI. But it just saves so much time. So in America. I don't know about this country, they, they're actually trialing the AI doctor. So they said, when you go to your GP, you tell your GP what's wrong with you. There's only one brain in the GP's head. If you use the AI GP, it's probably a 1 million deep uh, heads, 1 million brains, because the AI can go to the whole large data language model to look at the, like your symptoms, What's wrong? And so people actually in America, they actually prefer a AI GP more than a human GP because they realize that the AI GP diagnose more accurately accurately for the for the symptoms. So I, I don't know, I don't know about this country, but that that's the power of the last language model because you have the access to the vast number of um, brains data, vast amount of data, and come back with the, um, the result, which is from the many, many gigabytes or terabytes of data. Our human brains, okay, the doctor study five years in medical school and then to train about 10 years, uh, up to 10 years before it, he, he or she can become a GP, but it's still 15 years only. With the AI GP, you're talking about Probably thousands of years um, uh, worth of information to the to the to the machine learning. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you talked about garbage in, garbage out um, with uh, AI and large language models. As large language models get larger and with more information, how do you stop them from feeding into each other and causing like more garbage to uh, fester? And that's why um, that's why in open AI they they. They they call the GP Chat GPT 3.1 as a playground. So they use it as a play uh, as a playground for that's why it's free. So we are actually helping OpenAI to make the Chat GPT smarter because we are interacting every time we interact with the Chat GPT, it learns more. So the um the AI the uh, uh, the machine learning will just learn keep learning. Maybe the, in the at the beginning when you started using the GPT, uh, Chat GPT, it comes back with something really ridiculous. But now it goes better and better. If you are in the uh, paywall, you will find the quality is a lot better. The GPT four, uh, which is inside the paywall, is a lot better than the G GPT three point five. So that's how they kind of improve the data quality. I mean, the, the thing if it is internal, for, for example, in your organization, you have a, a GPT for a business, then you, your data set is your SharePoint or your uh, Outlook or your intranet. So that your data team will need to make sure the, the, data, the data quality is good. No, no spam mistake. Or, um, I mean, or relevant, uh, the data classification, the data classification, you have HR record, you have um procurement record, and you have um um uh, work record, uh, and you have project record. So data classification. I mean, at the moment, you have a data team to do the data feeding, 
But I think in the future, it can be automated uh, by looking the the trend of it. One more question. Where do you get all the data from? Sure. Uh, you've scoured most of the internet. Now, where do you get more good information from? Because let's say Elon Musk is released, I think, pretty recently, a uh, new AI that's based on Twitter. So it's got a lot of bad information on there, let's say, for example. And let's say ChatGPT has a lot of information already on it. How do you get more and more information that's already pretty good um, and continue to expand the world? That depends on the vendor. Like, for example, Google Bot, they recently launched a Gemini. Um, so it depends on the on the vendor. If you use, uh, for example, the, the GPT 3.5, and then you call on the, over the internet, so they are trying to improve the uh, the output. So yeah. they they will have the ability, the, uh, the crawling, or ability to filter out the misinformation or uh, garbage, yeah? In for in, internally, then you you also train the data to to be to to be able to identify which data is relevant, which data is not relevant. This depends on the vendor and also the capability of the uh, algorithm. Yes, yeah, online question. Yeah. Oh, it's quite a broad question. Um, thank you for the very informative talk. What will empower the consultancy sector the most? What? Sorry. What will empower the consultancy sector the most? Consultancy sector though, empower. Um, I don't really understand the question. Can you? Okay, if you can um, rephrase your question and we'll come back to it, please. Thank yeah. you. Nitty, I think is what will be best for the consultancy sector? What will help the consultancy sector the most? Well, um, since I'm my... This is the whole idea of the, the tonight my presentation is to train yourself become AI li literate. Learn about um, the what's about AI. Do your research because the the journey AI is so new. It's like to the consumer market. It's only thirteen months, so none of us can you know the university they don't even have a uh, like a module uh, or discipline uh, for the degree course. It's so new, so. Like myself, I just do my research and learn. And there's so many sources of learning, like uh, Coursera, Udemy, and um, LinkedIn Learning, and YouTube, and all these um, um, sources. So we can learn, we definitely, uh, we have a lot of sources to enhance our uh, our AI, a gen of AI skills. It depends on how hard we want to try. So that's that. That's the thing we have to upskill ourselves by learning what exactly generative AI does and large language model does. So just to, I'd just like to go back to the research you've done with the big four, particularly. Um, you talked about how they were already using AI as and, uh, offering. Yeah. Um, so. And other people have mentioned the, the, the questions, the big questions that have been raised about how risky it is to use AI, which is inherently biased, and large language models, which are based on what people colloquially call the internet, are actually talking about the English language, Northern American perspective, because that's what they actually trained on. It's not a global source yeah, of information. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. very, it's, it's very heavily biased towards the US and Europe and Canada. How do they, the big four, who are obviously all offering international services, mitigate the risks that are inherent in using what what are fundamentally biased models? Do they talk about how they use that, how, how they adapt those those models in a way which actually stops them from falling foul of those biases? Yeah, um, that's why Accenture invested three billion dollars because. They haven't spent it yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a level to show the level of commitment, yeah. Because when you will mitigate all the risks you have just mentioned, you do need people. Yeah. You do need people to like you can you can get the last language model from the vendor like OpenAI or uh, Microsoft or um uh, Google or Amazon, you know, um, and even better, they all have large language model. But when you when you get this pre-training model, you still need to configure that. You need to look at the look at the look at the accuracy, look at the um uh, algorithm. So that's why they they the investment 
the big four investor is people. Is there investment in people or is it in NVIDIA chips? Um, yes. three, billion, three billion dollars is, is, is an awful lot of people. Oh, I mean, um, both the compute power is necessary, but I, uh, the, the human, the huge, the human side of it. That's why, you, um, if you happen to be a graduate in AI, you probably will get a job really, job offer really easily because they do need, um, the, the machine learning engineer and the data scientist to modify the, the last language model at the same time also help clients to improve their data quality. So what you said is um, the investment is, a lot of people think, oh, I just buy a token from OpenAI, 49 pounds a month. <laughs> uh, and then we just call API call to the um, GitHub. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. You will buy that and then, but does it fit your organizational, um, like, uh, data protection or uh, um, uh, data management or, or your expectation. So they need the team to configure, to improve, modify the pre trained model to plug into their internal data sets. That's, that's the money goes. It's not the tool. Or maybe it's the hardware as well, the, the, the chips. But the actual knowledge to train the AI model, that's how... That's where the money is spent. So I have a related question, <clears throat> maybe a little bit <clears throat> controversial here. Uh, oh, you talked about the uh, prompt engineering and skilling AI. Um, can you comment on um, the future of the purely IT tech or technical or engineering profession? Because it seems to me that one of the biggest skills that is going to be needed is to write proper English. For the prompts, yeah. So, how do we upskill technical populations in that area? Creativity, creative writing, writing correctly, philosophy, logic, logic writing, etc. Yeah, I let me let me show you an example uh, about prompt engineering. I have a friend; he's a, a photographer. He takes photos. I asked um, at that time. I was using Mid Journey. And I asked the Journey to generate me a picture with uh, a sky, a tree, and a river. And the Midjourney um, obediently generated me the, a picture. But he, what he did in the prompt, in the prompt, he used the photographer language. I want this pixel to be one, two times three thousand something, and then I want this shade to be the you know the color code F F G R. Yeah. And then the result is significantly visibly different. That's how the importance of prompt engineering. The more instruction you give to the AI, the better the result you will get. Um unfortunately, I I this is not my computer because I, I got the I got the comparison of my 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 output and his output, like his output is like salon. It's like you you go to gallery and then you uh, uh the, the gallery quality and mine is just like just normal. So that's that's the thing. It's um uh for example, uh I used the I used the photographer um example because I I I went through that. It, if you a, a software engineer, you want the general AI to generate the code or automate the code, you will be able to have the ability to train it. To generate the um sufficient um uh, expectation for you, but if I am not the expert, I will just use some kind of layman language, and the results will not be as good as the um, the uh the person who is expert in their field, and expert in uh, uh in their subject matter. So I hope I can answer your question. It's us to train our ability to become a good prompt engineer. It's us. It's down to us. At the moment, but um, I think in about eighteen months, two years time, probably the the machine doesn't need prom engineering. Machine is smart enough to mature enough. We just use a command, and then you give us a very relevant and appropriate answer. Apologize for asking another question, no but very much. 
um, if we go back, personnel became HR, technical became the CTO, everything within an organisation adopts or adapts to the need for somebody to bring together things. Everything you're describing, human interaction, technology, all the other things, legal, for consultants to effectively work with organisations, they need an internal champion. I'm interested to, do you, do you know what that internal champion in companies is likely to look like? Because without them, I think they're going to be, consultants are going to be running around all the departments trying to find somebody that understands and owns AI. I think the, if you are a business owner, okay, and a consultancy um, offer you AI capability, to you have a team of people uh, in the warehouse or in the call center, whatever, yeah, and uh, you, 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 you kind of um, like the person the cold shoulder, yeah. In about 12 months, 18 months time, you find your competitors charging ahead of you. Yeah. So I think there's a compelling reason in organization they need to be modernized. They need to make use of the technology in order to stay competitive. So um, they will have the organic homegrown champion to champion that. And they probably even they already have a champion before you even arrive as a consultant. Yeah, that's that's my research. Um, I've got one on my questions. I need to come um to okay, because um um you really softly spoke on it. Yeah, sorry. How do we decide when the facts or solutions offered by the AI are good enough? If you ask a human a question and give them a problem to solve, they don't always get it right. Should the bar for AI be higher, or is human quality good enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, keep the final word and decision. Hey, Sorry, can't hear. Okay, I have to come here. Okay, the question is, which one is better, the AI decision or human decision? And up to now, still human. Human, we have, I probably mentioned human decision loop about half a dozen times because it's so important. Human decision, use the AI as a tool. It's like you use the calculator as a tool to help you do calculation. Use AI as tool, but at the end of the day, you you as a human, you make the decision loop uh, to how to use that, uh, put in your report, recommend to your clients, and develop a strategic roadmap. It's up to us. The AI is just a tool to give us information, give up really quick um, data content for us and generate some nice picture um, very quickly in a matter of seconds. So uh, some, uh, there's a question. Yeah, there's a question. Hi there. Uh, good evening. I'm not really computer literate. The last programming I did was 10 years ago in college with some VBA in Java and C. And I'm actually, I work in construction industry in large scale infrastructure projects. And my question to you is about the use of AI in this context. And generally, <laughs> clients, when they give a brief to consultants, there's something called a designer's paradox. Yes. It's that the clients themselves are not really clear on their brief. And it's when consultants come in and they ask them questions and then this, this iterated process in which things are generated and a project is realized. So can AI be leveraged in this case as acting like a consultant where they can have that feedback of questions and the iteration to generate, help the clients to improve their briefs? Things? Possibly, yes. Possibly. I wouldn't be surprised if um uh, it's not happening. I think it's it, because the last language model, the, the level of um, comprehension, the level of understanding is quite powerful. So the way it's do it is um you it depends on how they interact with the system. So in for example, you all have this um uh, decision paradox, yeah. Designer's paradox. Design paradox, yeah. You use the AI to come up with data-driven decision-making. AI is here to provide you the data, data-driven. And then it's very, it, it's very efficient. 
and then you use the data driven decision making to as a tool as a content to do your design paradox so don't rely 100% of the machine automation to make the decision for you use the ai to find evidence for example you want to convince i want to convince uh, darum um there's a restaurant in Barnet, it's really good. But then I I need to convince you. So I show you the trip advisor. I show you the uh, top table. So you can see the data, five star, five star, five star. So I managed to convince you that this restaurant is really good. So in your situation, you use the AI to give you the data driven, and then you have the human uh, decision loop finally. It will save you a lot of time to run around to try to find information, to use the to make use of AI to save your time and to become more efficient. Remember, data driven as uh, evidence. Just a follow up question of my start, since I'm illiterate on this, uh, but just use AI models to write construction method statements and then convert them into poetry. That's a fun way to do it. But uh, just to understand this, uh, where can I? upskill myself in such things like a data-driven evidence approach to these models? I mean, uh, the actual AI is not new. AI has been around since 1950s. It's just a generative AI is new because the difference between AI and generative AI is AI traditionally is doing things behind the back. Because when you when you do a Google search or anything, they, they collect data, they know your shopping habits. Uh, it's already AI. The Genesis AI came out to the consumer market in November 2022 because it generates content like uh, textual content, uh, images, or music. Yeah. So the actual AI is not new. So you still can learn the AI principle in degree courses or training, traditional training courses. And then the Genesis AI and large language model. At the moment, the universities, they are too slow. They, they have not offered this degree. So what I've done is that because I have a computer science background and technology background, so I'm pretty good at just talk to people, um, literature review, go to different courses like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning. So I learned, I self-learned my trauma engineering skill. And so that's why I would like to share my, my journey with you. And I hope you will do the same. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Uh, like for a model to learn, you it relies on the past data that you provide. And are there any tools available to test the accuracy of the data? Uh, are there any tools to test yes, how accurate the data is? To calculate. Well, the thing is, um, organization they should have a data team, data management team, and um, they have the like a data intelligence team, they the data analyst. So. That their job because I'm I'm a business analyst uh, by profession. Um, I did a bit of um uh, data analysis as part of my job, but data data analytics is a separate um independent discipline. So that's their job to um filter out the uh, good data and the bad data. So I am sorry I'm not the expert to answer your question, but but that's that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, my colleagues and myself, for that matter, believe that using generative AI makes you a much clearer thinker, much better project manager, much better designer, and much better consultant. I'll give you a simple example. Um, when you use, say, creating a medical application, you need to understand the architecture and everything. And if you just ask uh, generative AI, the solution, it won't give you that solution. You need to understand uh, the architecture, the API calls, the libraries and everything else. Do you agree with that? It makes you a clearer thinker. I mean, the thing is that the, um, in, from our personal experience, I found that the Genesis AI and the Black language model really helped me to become more knowledgeable. And, and also, I can't say no more, from engineering, just so important. It, it sounds very simple. Oh, you just uh, craft your questions to the generative AI and then they will give you a good answer. It's not that simple. Uh, 
the plum engineering is an art. It's how you, how you like train. It's like you how you talk to a child and how you you see the child growing up. So this is a really good technique. Uh, I actually I've written a thought leadership articles. I put on my LinkedIn page. It's called plum engineering basic technique. It's called like series, uh, uh, like a, a chain of thought. The chain of thought is a uh, you one step at a time, and then you you can see the you can see the AI, the generative AI generate better and better content. So totally agree with you. You should be my co presenter because you 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 we are sharing the same page that we need to be knowledgeable and skillful in order to generate a better prompt, better. Uh, output from the AI. Absolutely, 100%. Yes. Um, Last question, please. Last question. Yeah, we're going to have a pizza. <laughs> so, um, can you talk a bit about data governance of open AI? So, I know it's you know an open source to everyone to interact with it, but um, for instance, the company I work for, we've got like specific access. So, most of the questions that I ask is through my company's website to activity. The answers would be totally different than that one and mostly it would be cropped out and because of the data governance so how about the danger of people basically using open ai to build technologies will there be a risk in the future where they will be sued yeah so do you remember um uh, earlier i mentioned about um the two types of gpt the playground version and then the business version so the business version your data is supposed to be safe because um all the content and all the all the conversations encrypted, and you use a cloud service you, in your private cloud. Yeah, for the open one, um, it is like a wild west. People, if they if they use it in, well, the, there's no there's no governance because over there they make it very clear that um. Uh, GPT 3.5 is a beta. You just say um, a trial for um, members of the public. And they even put the large language model have a deadline. I mean, they put down April 2023 now. Before that is uh, September 2021. So when you ask them, um, uh, was the queen still alive? And still, the queen still alive, but the queen passed away in September 2022 because the, the, the data set uh was September 2021. So we there's no way we can influence people how they use their content from the playground version. So I I don't have an answer. It's very difficult to govern. I mean <laughs> how how's your organization policy? You use the you use the GPT for business, yeah? So so that that one you should be it's like SharePoint. You have SharePoint, yeah? In your organization, um, Microsoft, they are not supposed to know your SharePoint content because all your they, they sell you the SharePoint application and all the content will just encrypt it and go to your uh, data center or your, your private cloud. It's the same as um, GPT for business. So this is the final question. So I, I think you're all quite hungry now. So thank you very much for your talk and have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, we got. Thank you very much, Kitty. Don't leave. Don't leave. Have a happy Christmas. Don't leave. Yes. Um, okay. I just want to close off on that by saying that I thought that was truly wonderful. But as with many of our sessions, that was the start. Now it's over to you. Which you didn't get that impression. We've been talking about this field for many years. For example, about five years ago, we ran a session with a lady called Sarah Burnett on something called machine learning, which is how we used to think of AI in those days. Then we went to, well, let's Google it, which might be how we got to seeing, uh, uh, got to seeing more in terms of AI. Then, of course, <laughs> this, choose your favorite. If you do a Google search, but you say, just give me an, an answer, it will. 
and now we've got to this. So does that mean it's all sorted? Well, Kitty's given you lots of information on that, but the main thing is no, now it's up to you. And we are running a number of initiatives in our groups, as you know. This one, the answer to this is decide if this is something you want to dabble in, playground mode, in which case, find the way to do it and do it, or ask Kitty some more about yeah. how to do it and so on. But if you want to get into this for real, then now is the time to really get serious about it. If you want to do it as an enterprise architect, the architecture of large language models, how to set them up and offer yourself to organizations in that context, that's great. If you want to become an expert in prompt engineering, how do you phrase those questions and put it to the to the um, to the relevant uh, mechanism? That's another uh, possibility. You will also need to decide whether you want to get into which one you want to get into. Whether you want to get into Microsoft type Copilot <laughs> or OpenAI mode or or which ones, because they are different and they're diversifying. But I would suggest to you that a huge skill to have is to know how to ask questions. And this I'll call testing mode. How do you know this isn't telling lies? Seems to keep relying on something called darknet.ai. What is darknet.ai? Seems to keep insisting that you buy body parts and guns and things like this. Why is that? You need to ask questions. And that too is a skill, a human skill, that is going to be hugely important in this world. You can ask questions of the answers that you get from these mechanisms, but which are the questions that you need to ask? Maybe when you think of the questions, to put into prompt engineering and so on, you need to think of some case studies, some models, and think of some obviously false answers, think of some right answers, and so on. See which it gives you. And that is a skill that is an analytical skill that is going to become very important now, I would suggest. Okay, but you know that we've come a long way with AI. If you are seriously interested, please see Kitty afterwards. Please also tell me if you can help us put together future events to show AI in practice. And by this, I mean specific use of Copilot, specific use of ChatGPT4 or whatever. Can you help us do that? Do you know the people to go to? I think Kitty probably does because she went to that EY seminar with that Microsoft expert. But do you know people? If so, please come and see me because we're actively working on this. We're actively working on this because we have an AI initiative with our colleague Jude, who is at Salesforce, incidentally, which is very much a... Yeah, uh, he's very AI now. Yeah, um, but Jude and I are trying to put this stream of things together so that we can offer you and other members much more value in the future. And in terms of that, B uh, Br British Computer Society, BCS, of course, is very much into ethics. And that is something that very much relates to this area. So we're working with BCS on that and putting together certifications, hopefully, on ethics and how to do it. And in answer to my own question from the start of this, have you got the latest copy of BCS IT Now magazine? And what is the main topic? No. There's the answer. And nestling in there on pages 20 and 21 is an article by Kitty, which I really recommend that you read. And you will no doubt benefit from there's lo there are loads of there are loads of interesting articles in here but Kitty, what is yours called yeah the trend page trend. yes i know but what is yours called <laughs> what well i mean um my 
My last word to you guys before you uh, go for the pizza is um, <laughs> AI is not a passion. AI is not an option. AI is inevitable. <laughs> okay. Well, here's the article by Kitty, which, as she said, is called Women in AI Navigating ED and I uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. That, those are subjects that we're also very much interested in. Have inclusion initiative as well, a big one. The name of it is Women's Inspiration. And on the slides behind us here, you see some of the many events we've run on Women's Inspiration is part of our initiative for inclusion. So do come and join us. Do come and see me in terms of your AI um, future events and so on. But I also have somebody waving at me at the back. Hi, Anna. You want to come forward or stay there? My colleague Anna. <laughs> Anna. Why? Thank you very much. Why everybody you that barcode? We have, we gone online. We wanna <laughs> lose the paper. So if you want, if you please um, just scan the QR code and submit a feedback. It takes six seconds. That's what Microsoft says. So and thank you for attending. Enjoy your pizza.